This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 788, recorded on July 30th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. The weather outside is spectacular. This might be one of the best 10 days of the year. Uh, there's a light breeze. There's no humidity. The temperature's in the low 80s. Who could ask for anything more? Also joining me from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, I have the same lovely weather as Dixon. There you go. <laughs> From Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, 92 Fahrenheit and sunny. A typical Austin afternoon. We're headed for 95. The humidity is 52%, dew point 72. Classic Texas Austin day. Summer day. It's 27 Celsius here and pretty nice. A couple of puffy clouds. Uh, from Columbia Neurology, Kieran Thacker. Welcome to TWIV. Hey, thanks for having me. My pleasure. We're going to talk about a paper that uh, Kieran's the first author. And um, But uh, before we jump into the science, I just want to hear a little bit about uh, your training, Kieran. Um, just tell us how, what you had to do to get here. You're, you're a neurologist here at Columbia, right? Yes, yes, yes. I'm not a pathologist. <laughs> which I'm glad we clarified earlier. <laughs> Okay. So yes, I um I did my training in neurology um out in Boston of an institution um uh, in that city and then um and then I did training in neuroinfectious diseases and neuroimmunology at Hopkins um which has actually a very big program with lots of faculty who um specialize in infectious diseases and the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And really had a great, um, great opportunity to train there and did a lot of global health work because, as you all know, um, brain infections are um, really relevant uh, in our global community. So I studied cerebral malaria, TB meningitis, um, some aspects of uh, neurohiv um, and different encephalitides and, uh, and then started over here as faculty where I do clinical inpatient neurology. So um, I'm on service. I was just telling everybody uh, it's busy in the hospital. Unfortunately, we're seeing a bit more of COVID. Um, and uh, I see a lot of our acute cases that come in. There's actually a, a huge amount of neuroinfectious disease and neuroimmunology that we see kind of walking in the door that comes in being referred to us and um, direct our program in neuroinfectious disease here now, which is kind of one of the handful of programs in the country in which we um, study neuroinfectious diseases and get to work with lots of great uh, different people and, um, and also do a neurohiv clinic. So have a lot of variety from a clinical standpoint and, and do a good amount of research as well. So, um, so it's, it's a fun thing to be a part of and I uh, get to get to meet and, and work with a lot of great people like Peter. So, so, so you, uh, as a neurologist, you, you mainly deal with, infections of the nervous system or you do other neurology as well? My clinical job is kind of seeing everything. Um, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I end up, um, you know, seeing a lot of our, um, our cases that are, that are neuroinfectious diseases. Well. Uh, can you give me some examples of neuroinfectious diseases? Yeah, sure. So I can talk about what we, I can talk about what we saw this week. It's been a nice variety. Um, so cryptococcal meningitis came in. Um, we have viral encephalitis. We have, I think, three cases of Lyme. Um, there were cranial neuropathies and meningitis. We have HSV, um, meningitis, and encephalitis. Um, we actually have a really interesting case of um, a patient who had coronavirus OC43 and has a myelitis. And we're kind of trying to figure out whether it could be related or not. Um, and there's a lot of kind of overlapping questions with regards to like the immune side versus the infectious side. So there's, you know, oftentimes we're working um, both hand in hand with kind of neuroimmunology to figure out whether it could be immune mediated and or infectious. So um, 
those are kind of some of the things. That okay. while, I was, while I was on the faculty, uh, which was a while back, uh, the Department of Neurology was a referral center for neurocysticercosis. Have you seen yes, any of those? Yes, yes, yes. We see a lot of that. Okay. <laughs> so that hasn't slowed down at all then. No, no, it hasn't. I mean, it's interesting. We, um, you know, because of our Caribbean population that, you know, kind of we locally serve, we see a, a, a pretty significant amount of neurocysticercosis. So people come in with, you know, yeah, seizures, focal right. lesions. Indeed, cetera. indeed. What is the amoeba brain in infection? Uh, oh, that's Negleria. Do you ever see that, uh, Kieran? That's a lot more rare. We've had like one case of that maybe, I yeah. think in like the last yeah. year or two, right? It's like naturally like people who have been swimming in lake waters. Um, right. There was there was a pretty fulminant case um, that we had about a year ago, but, but mm -hmm. much more rare than what we see with neurosis. You'll have to process. move to Australia for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen any uh, AFM lately? Yeah, you know, we're on the lookout for it. Um, you know, as you know, I think we're we're concerned, obviously, and, and you know this all too well, Vincent, uh, that we may be seeing more of it coming in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, we are, we're kind of part of the study that you're involved in as well, just kind of making sure that we identify those cases early on. We haven't yet. Um, but again, you know, we kind of wonder whether start of school, kids being... Um, more closely interactive, we may see it. So, this is, so uh, acute flaccid myelitis, which is a consequent a consequence of some enterovirus infections, and we were supposed to have an outbreak in 2020 of uh, EV68 associated AFM. Mm -hmm. We didn't see it because of the lockdown and so forth, but All right. we're expecting mm -hmm. it now this fall, maybe big time. I don't know. So, what about West Nile? Yeah, we see a good amount of West Nile virus, um, especially obviously this time of year. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I think you all probably have gotten those city and state reports that they're spraying in the five boroughs. Um, we certainly have seen meningitis, myelitis, which is usually an acute flaccid uh, form as well. So, oh, wow. um, you know, and lots of we we have a good amount of kind of like tick-borne related insolidities that come through. We've seen a lot of Lyme in the last couple of weeks. That's well. interesting. Mm. So I think it's really interesting how you, you're sort of merging the neuroscience and the infectious disease work. When you were going into medical school, did you have an idea that you wanted to do one or the other? Um, sort of what was the background getting you to this point? Oh, yeah. Um, so, so I always loved medicine. I always loved neurology and localization and neurology. And I had actually worked um, really closely. I was shadowing when I was in college and then through medical school, um, one of the kind of like gurus of NeuroHIV who had a clinic. And so I saw firsthand what he was seeing and all the different types of um, effects that HIV had on the nervous system. And that, that really fascinated me. Hmm. And he also just was, he was also a general neurologist. So he knew so much about every aspect of neurology. So I always kind of wanted to merge that. And, it, you know, I decided like, should I do the ID path? Should I do neurology, but I really liked, you know, thinking about the brain and the nervous system. So I ended up doing neuro. Where'd you go to college? I went to University of Michigan. Ooh. You didn't yeah. know Kathy Spindler, did you? I did not. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big school, Vince. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's 10 people, right? Yeah. At least. That's why they call it the Big Ten. Yeah, uh, exactly. no, but, I mean, if she, if she were interested in uh, microbiology or virology she might have had kathy for some course you never know but, yeah i may but, have i you know it's been it's been a little while so kathy is one of our uh <laughs> it hasn't been that long <laughs> kathy is one of our uh co-hosts here into but she's not here today karen uh, dr wolf who you, whose name you probably don't recognize but uh was in the late 50s and 60s identified toxoplasma gandhi uh mm -hmm. in a uh, fetus that was suffering from hydrocephaly. And he was the one who championed the fact that uh, Toxoplasma gandhi was probably one of the most rare infections on earth to have caused this in an individual. And of course, as it turns out, it's one of the most common infections yeah. in the world, but hydrocephaly from you know, uh, intrauterine infection is a rare event. And uh, that, that was discovered here. So mm. we have some experience with infectious diseases and neuropathies. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the paper. Uh, the paper is called COVID-19 Neuropathology at Columbia University, 
Irving Medical Center, New York Presbyterian Hospital. You're the first author, Kieran, and lots of other people. And then we have uh, Jim Goldman and Peter Canole uh, at the end there. And I wanted to start by asking you, when in the course of the pandemic, I, I know we remember it early here in New York, Daniel Griffin had a, the first case was some financial guy that got mm-hmm. in fact and came here and was treated actually but yeah, when yeah. did you first March 1st, March 1st. <laughs> yeah when did we you, all remember that date yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when did you start seeing neurological symptoms um you know probably took close to the beginning you know mm-hmm. I mean you know as we see with the other systemic infections we were we were being called for people who um you know were confused and cephalopathic mm-hmm. and um there was a lot of questions about whether these folks should get tapped because we didn't know if they had maybe infection that it was involving their brain because you know these were very very early days mm-hmm. um so that was a pretty common um thing to be called about and then obviously people who are in the intensive care unit and thinking about all the potential complications that were occurring. So I would say it was, it was pretty early on that we were, we were directly involved with some of the care um, with regards to kind of our neurology position. So this would be hospitalized patients mainly, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know quite how to ask uh, this question, not being a clinical person myself, but <laughs> is there a a uh, particular spectrum of symptoms or collection of symptoms that you associate uh, specifically with uh, a SARS-CoV-2 infection, or is this sort of uh, more a general uh, uh, neurological uh, problem? Yeah. Well, that's probably the biggest question that's ex- that's existed out there, right? Is that is there something specific neurologically about COVID COVID nineteen versus other infections? Um, you know, I think to me, I, I I think of the disease based on severity very differently. So you know, I have people who have mild disease, um, and they, from a neurological standpoint, have you know things like loss of smell and taste, and we can discuss from a kind of virology standpoint whether we truly think that's neurological and I'd love, you know, Vincent's and everybody's thoughts, but, um, you know, headaches, you know, more kind of milder symptoms um, that we see with other viral infections, right? That's not necessarily specific to COVID-19, but it's certainly been characteristic. And then we, we see the more kind of moderate to severe cases in which we're really seeing, um, a constellation of, of symptoms related to systemic infection, um, kind of a profound systemic inflammatory response, hypercoagulability. And then the big question is, is, is there anything that kind of fits in there? And this is why we really began the autopsy study that's related to um, involvement of, of the virus in, in the brain. And we couldn't, you know, you can't really study that at the bedside very easily, um, especially with a transmissible infection. So we had done some, you know, early work on CSF analysis, but um, you know, CSF is kind of a surrogate marker looking at PCR and CSF is, um, has its challenges. Um, and although it wasn't detectable, you know, by our findings and now overall, there's been many studies that have looked at CSF, there have been kind of patterns in terms of like inflammatory responses in the CSF. And then the question is, okay, well, what does that really do, do in the brain? Like what, what is this virus doing in the brain? Is it all secondary effects or is it, is there something kind of primarily going on? So, so that question really was, was why we let, let ourselves to pathology. And I, I hadn't actually known Peter and Jim very well before this, which is kind of shocking. <laughs> um, and, and we all kind of met each other. We had a group of maybe like 30 or 40 people that we met every week and just talked about this. It was probably the mo- one of the most valuable experiences I've had during the pandemic. So, so I'm, this may be just showing ignorance here, um, but you mentioned some information about moderate and severe patients. Yeah. Um, so are you seeing neurologic issues in patients who have kind of mild respiratory symptoms or are you saying that there's a range in terms of the neurologic symptoms and do those correlate with the respiratory symptoms? So sort of how does this look in terms of what other people have seen in terms of mild versus severe? Uh, yeah. Disease? Yeah. So um, I think there are patterns of like neurological involvement that we see more commonly with let's say mild disease versus more severe disease. And by more severe, I'm really kind of meaning hospitalized people who are requiring oxygen or in the, you know, intensive care unit who, who need supportive care. 
um, who are treated, you know, aggressively for, for the um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, but I think like things, for instance, I mean, we can take loss of smell and taste, you know, certainly it's correlated with mild disease, but I think the problem there is that we probably don't have the history to understand that, you know, people were coming in here very, very sick, right? That they were very, very hypoxic when they hit the door a lot of the times. So we couldn't even get at a history of whether they had before they came in, you know, any change in their smell or taste, right? They were coming in very significantly ill. So there has been correlation of some symptoms, you know, specifically the the smell and taste with kind of milder disease. But I, you know, I think there's a, a history of related issues sometimes to that, if that makes any sense. Sure. So th this paper reports on a set of patients who, I guess, all died, right? Yes. Old, yeah. And it's, Rose brain autopsies. So. Yeah, all right. Yes, obviously. So <laughs> there are 40 some patients and did, did you do these over a long period of time or were they all done at once? How, how did you select them? Yeah, so they were um, any patient who was coming in that um, that was consented and agreed to our autopsy. Okay. So, you know, and Peter really led this work. So it was being done, um, you know, consecutively on, on people who agreed okay. over a period of time. So this was during that first wave of the pandemic. So it was really the original strain that we looked at, mm -hmm. which I think is important to think about as we kind of assess what our situation is now. Um, and, you know, Peter was, and I think, you know, hopefully we'll be able to hear from him, but, you know, the group here, there was a lot of concern about, um, you know, taking the bone off and exposure um, from just doing the kind yeah. of neuropathology. Mm -hmm. And so um, Peter led that kind of effort and, and, and really felt that it was important that we tried to do that here. And, um, and the neuropathology group really did a, a huge, tremendous amount of work during this time period where they were doing kind of autopsies around the, around the clock. But I mean, obviously we need to thank, you know, the patients and the families for, for really being willing to give us, you know, this information, which is, I think, as all of us know, right, because um, we do a lot of this work without really looking at tissue. Um, mm. That's really where the answer often lies. So, uh, so is there any sort of uh, selection for uh, patients based on symptomology or anything else, or is this basically a, a spectrum of individuals, all of whom have in common that they died? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So the latter, they had to have uh, evidence of infection. Okay. So okay. they weren't just presumed COVID-19 patients. So not all had neurological <clears throat> symptoms, right? No, I mean, the majority we, you know, I mean, especially during this time period, I think probably to just color this picture, um, we were, you know, there was huge limitations with PPE. We were often doing phone consults. People weren't getting detailed neurological examinations. So our involvement was highly variable. And so these were people, yeah, that died throughout the hospital. We often didn't know if they had, you know, neurological mm. symptoms or not. All right. So let's, let's go through some of the findings and, um, Talk about them. Um, I guess you, you did some CAT scans, right, on some of these patients and found basically hemorrhages in most of them. Correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was um, there was imaging that was done at, in a subset of individuals after they died, mm -hmm. um, which actually is incredibly challenging to do. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, our neuroradiologists. Um, essentially kind of led that effort uh, in doing in a subset kind of what we call post-mortem neuroimaging. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in a subset found, found brain hemorrhages, I think not really surprising to some of us, but I think obviously important in terms of the identification of, um, of those, you know, and we didn't see it in the pre kind of pre-mortem period. So again, we were kind of identifying neurological, at least gross pathology findings post-mortem in the imaging. So these hemorrhages and, and edema that you saw, these were a consequence of COVID, right? They're not something you find if you do random CAT scans of, uh, of people. Well, you know, I think we have to be careful with that, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it kind of depends on what you mean by a consequence of COVID, right? I think mm -hmm. that um, 
we were also doing a lot to these patients, right? Some some of them were anticoagulated. I see. Um, they, you know, have fluctuations in their blood pressure yeah. uh, in the critical care unit. So, um, you know, I think that they were hypercoagulable. Mm-hmm. Uh, their coagulation factors were off. So, um, so you know, in terms of uh, understanding a potential causal association, I don't think we could say that, but I think we can just say that we found these findings and, okay. um, you know, in a subset of critically ill patients overall that are non-infectious even, and those that have other causes of sepsis, we would expect to see some evidence of cerebral hemorrhages when they die. Okay. Was there any particular um, pattern to the hemorrhages that uh, would typify the COVID-19 rather than some other generalized hemorrhagic uh, events due to anticoagulation? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. I, you know, I think in other series and also some patients that we saw, they are, they did have evidence of this pattern of, of micro hemorrhages um, in a, a condition that has actually been associated with influenza in children right. called acute hemorrhagic necrotizing leukoencephalopathy. Mm-hmm. And so not necessarily in the, we saw mainly kind of like bigger hemorrhages, but um, certainly in patients that we've cared for as well as in the literature, there's been this identification of, um, of kind of micro hemorrhages that are predominantly in deeper structures of the brain. So mm-hmm. areas like the thalamus and basal ganglia, they're very symmetric. Um, and again, you know, that's a pattern that is not necessarily unique to COVID, but something seen with influenza and other infections as well and has been so described now. And anyone who recovers from this, as unlikely as that seems, um, do those have permanent effects on those people's ability to just behave like normal people? The um, the necrotizing leukoencephalopathy, or just yeah, hemorrhages the, the hemorrhages general? that you've seen with COVID nineteen. Uh, yeah. not everybody dies from it, obviously. Mm-hmm. But is that an end stage um, sequelae, or is that uh, something that people can recover from? But yeah. because of that, the, the, there should be brain damage in those areas, right? Because they were lacking oxygen for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on where your hemorrhage is um, and how big it is, um, how much it expands over time. So I think in people who survive, you know, let's say you have a bleed that's involving mm-hmm. kind of the frontal part of your brain or the cerebellum. Um, sometimes those people actually do okay. Um, will they have some deficits? Yes, but that's very different from a hemorrhage that's, you know, maybe on the left side and huge and it's going to affect their ability to um, use their right side of their body to speak. So really, you know, like kind of classic localization, we think about um, where the, where the lesion is. And we are um, now in the stage of um, working on kind of setting up follow-up for a lot of our patients who have been hospitalized with COVID and identifying whether kind of what, what outcomes they do have. So I, so I was, as a follow-up, if you don't mind, I was interested in uh, the loss of taste and smell. Mm. Um, often when you lose your smell, you lose your taste because there's a lot of yes, <laughs> taste yes. associated with smelling, right? So yeah. um, was there, were there specific regions of the brain that had mm. hemorrhages associated with where the signals from the nose end up? Because we have this famous guy called Richard Axel here. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Might have been a good consult for this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot of studies that are going on. And actually, one of our uh, kind of a group of colleagues along with um, Richard are doing a lot of work. And I think Peter is actually involved um, looking at kind of the olfactory structures. I will say, I don't think it's related to, to blood, but I think we've certainly very carefully tried to look at the kind of olfactory epithelium, olfactory nerve, olfactory bulb to see whether we see virus and how it could be um, impacting the sense of smell. Um, There have been, you know, I think, I think that, you know, this is a kind of hot topic where there's a bit of controversy. We really didn't see virus in um, like neuronal structures. So we didn't see that there was virus in the bulb. Um, it's really been identified that mainly the kind of olfactory epithelium um, cystencular cells are what wow. are affected. Yeah. Um, and so that's why you get that loss of smell. The loss of taste is a bit more complicated, whether it's truly just an, kind of an association of right. um, smell versus actually impacting you know, structures, you know, I haven't found a good study on that. I don't know if you all have, but I haven't really seen it. I mean, when we think of 
neurological structures. We think of, you know, glossopharyngeal nerve and mm-hmm. vagus nerve, but I haven't, you know, and, and there's been, there was one German group actually, yes. which had found, they thought that they yeah. had found virus in the, I think it was glossopharyngeal or uh, right. vagus nerve. Um, I think those results, you know, are interesting, right? Um, but again, like not diffusely, and we actually didn't look at those nervous uh, nerves in our study. So I don't know if we can really comment on it, but there is this question of whether they may be affected. I don't know if you all have seen a good study. Vincent, have you seen a study well, that actually, is like really... The study you refer to from Germany, we did that on TWIV months ago. And yeah. I, I remember they thought that maybe the virus got in the, the olfactory epithelium and they found some RNA signal, you know, close by mm-hmm. in the brain. So, and so their conclusion was in a very small fraction of cases, the virus may enter the brain that way. But mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. I haven't seen anything else that approached that um, yeah. at all. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I haven't either. So, um, so overall, it's then, then you do neuropathology where you make sections, right? And and you, you look at them. So overall, what what are the findings there? I know there's a lot of uh, hypoxic. Da- In fact, all the brains yeah. had hypoxic damage, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, across the studies, that's really been the most common finding, which, mm-hmm. you know, again, is not surprising, right? These are people who came in who were critically ill. I will say kind of what's interesting is that um, we had patients ranging kind of a, a pretty large amount of time from the time of their initial presentation to death. Mm-hmm. So we had people who were, you know, coming in very ill and unfortunately passed away very fast, kind of within 24 hours. And then we had people who were in the hospital for weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and overall, we found that there was hypoxic ischemic damage in both of those populations. And why I think that's important is because, you know, you would think that, okay, the more acute the patient comes in, Um, maybe less hypoxic ischemic injury they potentially have, but I think it just speaks to how much hypoxia we were seeing really early on. And, and maybe that these people either were coming in late or they had, you know, some, and you probably discussed this kind of from a pulmonary standpoint, kind of this kind of thought about like silent hypoxia and a lot of these individuals and what that means. But from a brain standpoint, I think that's really Hmm. important, right? Because um, we're curious about in survivors, how much we're going to really Really see of that in those people who may not have been, you know, having florid symptoms for a long period of time, how much we're going to see. So we mm-hmm. certainly saw a huge amount of, um, really in all our, our cases, we saw hypoxic ischemic damage that kind of ranged in severity. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also saw strokes. So, you know, we talked about bleeds, but we also saw ischemic strokes as well. Again, I, I don't think very surprising. Um, and so that's kind of the gross pathology findings overall that we found. So you found microglial activation in many of the brain. What, what does that mean? Yeah. So we found kind of these areas where there was um, activation. It was kind of a very interesting signature, which I learned about a lot from our neuropathologists, where we saw these aggregations of microglia. So essentially focal areas of neuroinflammation called kind of microglial nodules and neuronophagia in which kind of the neurons collate around those microglial nodules is the best way I think of it. Peter probably has a more elegant way of thinking about it. But um, those were kind of areas that we saw um, in a lot of the brains and predominantly in the brainstem Mm -hmm. and actually has been really replicated in a lot of different studies. Um, And what is classically associated with those findings is encephalitides. So, mm-hmm. so we talked about kind of what we see as neuroinfectious disease folks. So kind of both immune mediated, but also infectious encephalitides. So things like herpes or NMDA encephalitis, you see kind of those aggregated areas of microglial nodules and neuronophagia. And we saw that here, which we thought was really interesting. You know, why is that happening? Why is it in the brainstem? What does it mean? Is it some signal that something's going on? But what was really actually interesting is that um, versus kind of other florid infections that affect the brain as well as um, immune mediated process, we didn't see like a florid amount of diffuse inflammation and kind of T-cell activation. There have been studies that have seen that. We didn't see as much of that. And we actually had a really interesting case which was a disseminated herpes simplex virus case Mm. that also had COVID and ended up having HSV encephalitis as well as COVID. 
And so there was such a striking difference between the pathology in this herpes simplex case, which was like fluid inflammation and these microglial nodules, but just the inflammation was so dramatically different from COVID that that was, uh, you know, kind of an interesting um, contrast. And so, you know, one question we had and, and, and have is what do the, what does this path neuropathology really mean? You know, classically kind of associated with the conditions I mentioned, but is it, is it really like it, does it, does it truly mean that there's an infection or inflammatory process that's primarily in the brain or does it mean that there's something more systemic going on? Could it be related to hypoxic ischemic damage and like a secondary downstream effect? Is it related to systemic inflammation and a certain kind of degree of systemic inflammation that then affects the nervous system? And so that's kind of where we are in terms of our thinking. And, you know, we can talk about, you know, kind of what the studies are going on now. But um, but that was a major finding. I think that's been really overall very consistent in the literature is that there's been these areas of microglial activation. So I, I don't know if this is possible in these types of studies, but is there a way to actually look at what types of products those microglia are making um, to see if there are differences in their inflammatory mediators and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there are, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question, but I think there are, um, you know, and I know there are more studies that we're doing to kind of delineate some of the processes. Like I know, for instance, in Dr. Canole and Dr. Goldman's work, they do a lot of um, single nucleotide RNA sequencing. So there's a way to kind of look at um, what the immunological signatures are of the pathology. So um, that's something that's really of, of great interest um, now as well. Uh, so am, uh, uh, I'm okay. Th am I okay thinking uh, of uh, microglia as basically brain macrophages? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a, uh, that was a, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I get it. Um, uh, I'll so, take it as an immunologist. <laughs> um, you got a B plus rich. Um, <laughs> what sorts of things activate microglia? Does it have to be uh, what well, the message I'm getting is that uh, activation of macrophages doesn't necessarily indicate the focal presence of a pathogen. There can be other things that activate. Yeah, no, it's a whole variety of things, right? right? So, I mean, yeah, I think any inflammatory process in the brain, you know, okay. I think whenever there's injury to the brain, you'll kind of see something potentially that okay. is activating microglia, right? It's like a response to in the brain, right. essentially. How so. about evidence for uh, viral replication and brain cell death in yeah. the areas where these accumulate? Is there any evidence for that? Yeah, so so overall, I would say in our study, we really found, and I think one of the strengths of the work we did is that we tried to look at multiple modalities to find virus in the brain. So we didn't just take RT-PCR, but we also looked at RNA scope, and we looked obviously at in situ, and took a very detailed look, you know, in, in many many um, brain sections. Overall on immunohistochemistry as well as RNA scope, we really didn't see any evidence of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what was really striking is we also had the opportunity to look at olfactory epithelium and kind of contrast our results, especially with RT-PCR. And the levels are just so dramatically different because I think similar to other studies where we found those kind of like low levels of um, a viral RNA by RT-PCR. And the question we were scratching our heads on and others have as well is like, well, what does that mean? Um, and I think the thinking is, is that it really doesn't represent true viral infection as we would see in other kind of florid CNS infections, but that, you know, whether it's related to virus in the blood or some other mechanism that we think maybe maybe giving you these low levels. But I don't know, Vincent, what do you think in terms of that? That's yeah, kind I, of, I, that was our way of putting it together. I mean, the, the results are pretty clear. The RNA levels are extremely low and they don't coincide with any areas of, uh, you know, microglial activation or anything like that. And I think you, you say in the, in the discussion, it may just be uh, RNA brought in by the the circulatory system, I think that makes perfect mm. sense. There's you would I mean the the herpes case is as you say is striking. You get all kinds yeah. of inflammation and infiltration, and you don't see any of that here. Now, I mean, this is very late after the initial infection in most of these patients, right? It's weeks afterwards, so uh, you you might not expect to see it anyway. But there's no persistence, as you say, and 
probably there was never any reproduction. I would agree with that. And in fact, yeah. everything else I've looked at, well, I, I, I wanted to discuss this here because I, I think there's been a little bit of uh, haziness in the field. Yeah. And especially some people have done brain organoid infections and find you can infect brain mm -hmm. organized. So they assume that it must infect the brain, but you know, that's not necessarily the case. And this, to me, this is quite a, a clear outcome. 40 some patients, no evidence of active viral reproduction in the brain. And as you say, all the pathology, a consequence of, or most of it of hypoxia, most likely. So, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I will, you, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. No. Uh, as you uh, said, the, uh, uh, there's a striking difference between the amount of uh, viral RNA that you found in nasal epithelium mm. versus mm -hmm. other uh, tissues. And I'm, uh, I, of course, I know essentially zero neuroanatomy, but uh, I assume that the nasal epithelium is pretty close to the olfactory bulb. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah. Are yeah, they like yeah. right up against each other? They're near each other. They're very near okay. each other. Yeah. Because that, to me, uh, is is the really striking finding. Because you find yeah. all sorts of RNA in the nasal epithelium, uh, and except for one example here that I'm seeing, but generally uh, mm. uh, much much less to nothing. Uh, yeah. in the olfactory bulb. And that, that to me is a striking contrast. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I mean, um, I, you know, I think the question is, is there are discrepancies in the, in some, uh, not discrepancies, but I think variability in, in findings. So some people have seen higher levels in the olfactory bulb. There's, and, and uh, you know, we all kind of know this literature probably, but there's a lot in the literature about, and Vincent, you know, I'm sure you're aware of this, and this is probably why we're talking about it, of the neuroinvasiveness mm -hmm. and neurotropism of SARS-CoV-2. I think we have to be really careful with those yeah terms, right? Have we truly identified that this is, at least with the original strain, is this a neurovirulent virus? I think that the jury is still really out and overall our results at least, and I would say the majority have shown that it that it's not, mm -hmm. um, although we somehow have to explain interesting findings, right? So we still exactly. have a lot of neurological findings in the acute setting, whether they're secondary to systemic effects, whether they're somehow related to other structures that are near neuronal structures. And then we have the kind of like after effects of COVID that I think we're still trying to understand, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of um, people feeling kind of brain fog and um, feeling kind of like they're cognitively slowed. Like, where is that coming from? You know, what, what's going on in the nervous system to actually develop that and what does it mean? Like, I think we, exactly. we don't know. <laughs> so there's the easy, so, the simple answer. But. So they have these wonderful, um, every now and then the, uh, the, the uh, I guess the American Society for Pathology issues these um, unknown cases in a box of slides and there are 25 of them or so. I remember in the old days, at least they did. Uh, they did this for parasites and for viruses and protozoa and neurological conditions. Mm -hmm. If you had to make your differential diagnosis based on just what you saw rather than knowing whether that was a patient with COVID-19 or not, what other diseases mm -hmm. would come to mind that matched up with what you saw? Mm -hmm. Do you have a differential that, that here's the short list and here's the long list of <laughs> You know, micro hemorrhages, uh, accumulations of astrocytes and astromicroglia and that sort of thing. And, and then patient death. I mean, this is a huge mm -hmm. difference with regards to chronic diseases of varied sorts, right? This is an acute disease. Yeah. Any other things pop into your mind that uh, yeah, I mean, look I like think this? Yeah, I think what's well now. I think what we're trying to do, and uh, Peter and Jim have done a lot of work on this so far, is to look at other causes of, um, of sepsis and ARDS and yeah, see whether yeah. we see those patterns because I think the question is, is this just the end result, which is interesting, right? And actually is kind of a big unknown is, is this the end result of critical illness, right? Or kind mm -hmm. of diffuse hypoxia? And we just didn't look before. Um, and that really truly like neuronophagial and microglia nodules are, are kind of the end result of that pathway rather than 
this being a CNS infection, which I, you know, I think yeah, we've no, determined it's not right. Mm-hmm. Like there's right. just, there's too much discrepancy between what we're seeing overall and um, mm-hmm. kind of the inflammatory response. I will say that, like, I think in some of the kind of immune mediated processes, so kind of immune mediated encephalitis, this is, this is almost more consistent with that, which is interesting. And there has been some work looking at, you know, cytokine levels and kind of um, antibodies that have been identified within the brain and people who have SARS-CoV-2. I think that's interesting. Like what, how much, you know, could the inflammatory response and the kind of immune mediated process of this is acting, actually impacting what we're seeing from a brain standpoint, I think is where we're headed um, rather than direct infection. Now, whether that changes with with Delta variant and other variants that we may see, I think is also something we need to understand, right? Because as um, as infections, as we all know here, kind of evolve, they can change in terms of their ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and to penetrate the nervous system. So uh, I think that's also a question we need to answer and, and hopefully we will. I mean, we're kind of hoping we can do further work. And I mean, I'm hoping we don't see more COVID, but... Um, but I think we're going to do, see do you, this new period. Do you have any evidence that Delta is doing something different in the brain? No, I mean, not, not at all. Okay. I mean, I think, but I don't think we know. I mean, I don't think anybody has studied it. Um, yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's probably too early to really yeah. know. I'm not yeah. sure. I mean, in India where they had the first peak, I'm not sure if there's initial work that's identified. Mm. Certainly we haven't. From a kind of anecdotal standpoint, there hasn't been reports of like more neurological findings okay. with um, with the Delta variant. But I think that the jury's out in terms of whether it would create a different form of neuropathology. Sure. I just don't think we sure. know. This, uh, this discussion reminds me of the paper we did last week uh, looking at um, basically intrinsic or innate immunity in uh, patients uh, with COVID where a control group that they had was people who were ventilated in the ICU, but Mm. SARS-CoV-2 negative. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like, those are the brains you want to compare, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 Can can we talk a little bit about, you mentioned this long COVID and I mean, is there, is is what you see here part of it, but long COVID also happens in very young people. And so what you probably have no autopsies of that. So what would, to talk about this yeah um well i guess i I don't know i don't know if we should be calling it long covid but (laughs) i think it's well there's a name from uh, post-acute post-acute what is the name pask right Pask. yeah okay sorry sequelae yeah (laughs) that was the first name that it got i know i know and i think that i think the europeans call it long covid it just it, it i think the reason why i think it's we have to be careful is that i think it makes people think that they they still have active infection right 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 so anyway, great, great <laughs> point. That's a great point. Yeah. So, um, so you know, I, I think this is a big challenge. This is going to be the biggest challenge. I think we still don't know what this is at all, mm-hmm. um, and I think we have we have data mainly. And there was a recent um, NIH conference on this um, a couple of weeks ago, and I reviewed the data kind of to date in terms of um, what we have to understand. Um, the, these syndromes, right? I wouldn't even call it a syndrome. I think it's, I think it's a heterogeneous group of symptoms that people have across the spectrum of prior COVID, um, and it's really predominantly self-reported symptoms in um, patients who are very much self-selected. So I'm not sure it's really, uh, you know, kind of from my review. I think the voices that we're hearing, and certainly it's kind of consistent across populations, is that people who had asymptomatic or or mild disease certainly don't feel normal Mm -hmm. after they've had their infection, right? There's, you know, cognitive fogging, fatigue, sleep-related disturbances, Um, and I hear it all the time here as well. I mean, I had COVID, I don't think I feel entirely myself either. So um, I think I think it's a real entity, what it is and what it means and mm-hmm. how how we can like anatomically think about this and pathogenically think about this. I don't think we understand yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's, you know, the, the patients like like that we saw, right, in autopsy who were so severely ill but ended up surviving. 
right? And they're almost a, a distinct group. We know in that group, just looked, looking at other conditions in the ICU, there's a huge burden of cognitive impairment. Um, mm-hmm. There's a, a huge significant burden of myopathies and neuropathies from critical illness that we're expecting to see. Whether we see different patterns, you know, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't assume that we would, but then the question is, is, is somehow COVID-related um, inflammation that we see in the acute period then giving people more symptoms than they would in this kind of typical post-acute COVID, uh, post-acute kind of sepsis mm. uh, state. So. But just being intubated in itself causes problems, yeah. right? Those yeah. sorts of yeah. issues as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the signal that's coming out is there's something about having mild or asymptomatic that then, you know, people are not, yeah. you know, at their prior baseline at all. So symptoms like brain fog, fatigue, these are these are neurological symptoms, right? So are they too- Yeah, although I think that's also hard to classify, right? I mean, uh, we were, you know, we've all been in a pandemic. Um, I think there's um, psychosocial stressors, you know, certainly people, people's yeah. lifestyles have changed. People's weights have changed. Yeah. People's, you know, we've all, we've all changed in our physiology, right? So- yeah. I don't know. You know, I think, again, what will be systemic, what will be psychiatric, what will be neurological, I think is this big kind of overlap. Yeah. Are, are there scales or ways that you can actually measure brain fog or confusion or things like that? I've kind of wondered how how you quantitate yeah. that. Yeah, there's there's not, although people are certainly working on it. I mean, the, the term brain fog actually is interesting. I don't I hadn't actually heard it like I mean, it's not a scientific term. Right. But it really has emerged very strongly from this. And I think mm. very much consistently people, that is what they describe, yeah. right? This kind of like sure. foggyness that well, people Well, you know, have, there's, so. there's this chronic fatigue syndrome, right? MECFS, yeah. they have, those patients have talked about brain fog for decades now. Yeah, right? yeah, that's true. Yeah, They're, they're yeah, actually screaming yeah. now that we told you so. We t- <laughs> because Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. No, 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 absolutely. Absolutely, so it's, yeah. it's hard to imagine given the number of people who have died from this, that there's some uh, uniting underlying health issue related to those people only. Mm-hmm. But but it could relate to their recent exposure to something that had nothing to do with the COVID-19, but rather something common in the environment, which when you put COVID-19 on top of that, you're going to get a different outcome than if you were just a regular person like you or I that you caught it at a mm-hmm. movie theater or a restaurant or, you know, just walking down the street. Mm-hmm. Um, because you, you you can't help but you, you can't ignore the fact that in the beginning of this uh, pandemic, everybody was saying that if you're a person of color, if you're overweight, if you have type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, you're doomed. Basically, it's just targeting the worst possible population that you could imagine that has no benefit to begin with. And here they are heaped on on top of that. There's another disease that they have to put up with. That hasn't actually borne out, has it? That is Um, to say, there are no specific groups that you can point to, like obesity. Let's just take that for an example. Are mm -hmm. all of the patients that have died from COVID-19, they're not all obese. Um, they're not. Yeah. I mean, we've certainly seen risk factors, right. That are associated with poor outcomes. So I think, you know, things like obesity is certainly a risk factor for poor outcome and severity of illness. So I think the patterns are there. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, obviously our, our local population, um, has been hit very, very hard um, by COVID-19 here. Is that true for the 40 patients that you autopsied? terms of their overall risk factors, yeah. So they, um, you know, there was a significant number who were obese, who had hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. Yeah, so they were. And the average um, age was like 72, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An older population. So I think in general, kind of what we saw um, with COVID in general, in terms of the people at high risk for severe, severe illness. Okay. Well, um, we, we could talk for a long time, but I'm going to let you go because I promised you an hour. And um, <laughs> but you're, con- you're, you're, con- you're continuing to work on what you call neuro COVID, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. So yeah. Um, perhaps we'll have you back again in the future when. Yeah, sure. No, I'd love to. I'd love to. I'll, 
try to hook in the virology. Yeah, but, you know? one, one, one more before you leave, please. Yeah. I don't yeah, yeah. recall you're saying whether or not when the patients were first admitted that they isolated virus from those people. Um, when they were first, you mean in, in our series or? Yeah. Yeah, so they were all positive. Um, they were all PCR. positive yeah, for they were antibodies all or for the? Oh, for PCR. PCR. Yeah, oh, for PCR. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, so we, they were all kind of. So they had it. ongoing viremias as you were treating them or as mm -hmm. they were being treated. Well, not viremia, just nasopharyngeal swabs, right? Yeah, yeah. So their nasopharyngeal swabs were, yeah. were positive. And I mean, I will say this, right? We're not able to do brain autopsies on people that may have had forward neurological symptoms. So I, I, I don't think it's out of the question. And maybe this is what was described in um, the discussion with, with our German colleagues is, could, could there be rarely neurological involvement? I don't think we can answer that question. Mm. You know, in 40 patients who, who died of, you know, bad systemic disease. They weren't necessarily PCR positive when they died, right? Because you had some people who yeah, were diagnosed as having COVID, but were it was a week month later out. that they died. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. So they had prior evidence of right. PCR positivity. There were a number. I mean, interestingly, where you know they were they were actually were tested on autopsy, and they were a number that were still positive. But certainly, yeah, they could have been infected. And before. you had other people who came in were diagnosed with SARS-CoV two and died within a day or so, right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There was a pretty significant variability in terms of time to death. Uh, Kieran, this one herpes encephalitis patient, did that develop in hospital or was it there already, you think? Yeah. So very it's it's a strange case because it was it was actually disseminated infection. I mean, I think they were they were immunocompromised, um, yeah. but it was disseminated throughout their body. So we think and, and they clinically deteriorated in the hospital. So I think it developed while in house. They were they were hospitalized for a long time, actually, I think. So mm. I, I feel like this is all just so fascinating. So I guess what do you think is kind of the next big question that you're trying to answer? Or what is the next big open question? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so there's a lot. Um, <laughs> I think, I think what happens to survivors, right? I, I mm. think that, I think we have to understand that better. What's happening in the brain with people who, who are now living and have survived from COVID-19. So we, we have a neurologist on our staff at Columbia, Ian Lipkin, Mm, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. the early survivors <laughs> yeah, yeah. and claim to have had brain fog and all the other things that you were uh, talking about. So it would be uh, interesting um, to see if his brain fog has cleared up. Yeah. 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 He's another neurovirologist, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's, I mean, a, a Botafita he? neurologist with a neurological That's right. he, he disease. Trained, uh, yeah, yeah, he's trained in neurology. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Of course, he's he doesn't see patients anymore. <laughs> Or if he ever did, uh, I don't know. But I remember he had for months uh, trouble walking yes. up inclines. He couldn't catch his exactly. breath. I don't know if that's still Fatigue. the case. I should ask yeah. him because I, I talk to no, him all the that, time. Yeah, no, I mean, I had it and I certainly didn't feel it. Really? I, you I, was had, round, I was rounding today and I was also had, had the disease. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Most wow. of us did here, but yeah. So you caught How it you here doing? probably, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Wow. Mm. And mm. you still have, uh, you don't have to answer, you still have long-term effects you think i you know <laughs> i don't think i'm at my like mental status based on my <laughs> no, was, in terms was, i saw you know i saw these consults this morning and i was you know semi joking with the residents but i was like you know i've seen you know i used to be able to see 12 15 people and be like you know crisp and now it's you know it takes a little hmm. i don't know there's multiple factors and you know, i'm growing older I, <laughs> I would take your brain fog anytime over what i've got <laughs> i don't know yeah you don't have to include that but <laughs> all right karen thacker columbia medical center thank you so much it's been a pleasure yeah, talking to you yeah thanks for having thank me thank you, you. No, it's thank been, you. it's, it's been awesome. a great time yeah Terrific. thanks everybody okay bye 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 so, bottom line, uh, they don't find virus in the brain. No. Yeah, all okay. the stuff they see is probably uh, uh, due to hypoxia and, and inflammatory right. cytokines. And right, right, right. Right, which, which, re -raises in, which re raises in my mind how about other non respiratory system, symptoms? Okay, because we've discussed this before. Right. Uh, uh, the various coagulopathies, 
and, uh, you know, kidney issues uh, and other systemic issues uh, are those because of virus um, doing things outside of the respiratory tract or are those a consequence of uh, secondary effects of what's going on in the respiratory tract? Innocent bystander type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think there's I, been controversy on that, there right? Is. There's I mean, people yeah, who there has. Yeah. I don't. I've yet to see so good evidence for virus reproduction in those kidney GI mm -hmm. tract. Right. I mean, people think they see it, but you know, I remember when B Nash was and Hatsiano were on. They had a paper with some uh, GI sampling, and they saw uh, by EM one virus particle in a cell, right? <laughs> But that's not enough, right? And you can't even tell what virus it is, right? So right. Well, and the same for for the cardiac issues. You know, there's all yes. this talk yeah. about vascular yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. cardio cardiac issues, and what is that actually right. resulting from? Yeah. No, that was very uh, interesting dear, to dear. get a clinical yep. viewpoint. And, I mean, I think to me, these are all people who died, right? And they're someone's family, that's right. and that's in the end, they're humans, and. Exactly. It, they shouldn't have. They would have maybe died of something else. You know, what's interesting is that um, many of these people had signs of dementia already, you know, the plaque formation and all that, right? Oh. Which we know happens before clinical presentations. You see, you get, and so when people die, you know, prematurely, auto accidents or whatever, and if they do an autopsy, they can see these tangles already forming and that they didn't have symptoms yet. So, right. It makes me wonder what my brain looks like. You don't want to uh, know. You don't want to know. Right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. You're okay, right? You're talking. You're walking around. I think so. So yeah. it appears. So I mean, it appears. Okay, so. No, no, Rich, I'm with you. <laughs> uh, Vincent, before we move on, we skipped over yeah, our sorry. PSA. Please, please do your PSA. Uh, so public service announcement. We want to the uh, ASV town hall vaccine education uh, meetings. Took a little hiatus during the ASV meetings, and they have rebooted. Um, so these are Zoom meetings with uh, two, usually two out of a panel of 50 experts on uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, uh, who uh, you can meet with them uh, for 45 minutes and uh, they will uh, interact with you directly and you can answer, uh, you can ask uh, all of your questions and they will answer them to the best of their ability. The site is asv.org slash education. And uh, looks like we've got a good lineup at this point. Um, July 29th is done, but I see one, two, three, four, five, six future meetings, including one that features an individual, Vincent Racken, Rack. Uh, raccoon, raccoon, black, black and yellow. raccoon yellow. Raccoon yellow, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if you or anybody you know has questions uh, about uh, COVID and in particular about the vaccines, please steer them to this. I think we're in a critical point in this pandemic we are. where there's a large unvaccinated population, vaccine hesitant, if you like, uh, that uh, need good information to help them make the right choice. Uh, and get vaccinated, and this is the place to find it. So, Rich, uh, along those lines, uh, recent pushback from mayors and um, uh, governors of various states, not saying which states, but uh, you used to live in one of them, um, <clears throat> They are reacting. Now I live in another one. And now you live in another one. You haven't. You haven't escaped. <laughs> the point is that that they, these people are pushing back at some of the facts that you're listing now as contrary to what they were originally told, and what they're not paying attention to is the fact that the science has been changing. And the data have been changing, and the recommendations have to change accordingly. And and everybody wants a consistent answer, right? They want to know: Should I wear a mask? Shouldn't I wear a mask? Should I get infected? In, injected? Or, you know. And you can't give them a straight answer on this. You have to give them a scientific answer. How do you handle that? That's right. Well, I think that uh, this is going to be uh, this is going to be ongoing part of this TWIV discussion, I think. I mean, they uh, had a go health forward. officer but from... I think, I think you deal with it in exactly the way you suggest, uh, Dixon. And that is, sure. uh, there you 
uh, you cannot think about any of this stuff in black and white terms. A lot of it's gray. And you can't think that uh, it's, uh, you have to uh, understand that our understanding of the disease, uh, two things are going on. Our understanding of the disease evolves. Right. And it's also, I'm, mm, the circumstances of the disease involved. The, uh, there are uh, variants that I'm, we need to talk about uh, that may play into uh, how the plan- pandemic is uh, evolving. Uh, the vaccination status of the population, the behavior of the population, all these things change. They all interact and uh, change the dynamics. And public health is in the awkward situation of having to respond That's to right. all of those changing conditions. No and it's appropriate, frankly, yeah. That they that their recommendations change depending on the conditions. They're doing so all, the best they can. All your old town halls, those same people should come back and listen oh. again because well, the, one the thing, same Dixon, questions have different answers Dixon, now. The one thing that doesn't change is you right, need you should to get, get vaccinated. I know this. vaccinated. I know this. Yeah. I know yes. this. If more people I know were this. vaccinated, we wouldn't have any of these issues. That's right. I learned this week that only half of Staten Island is vaccinated. That's right. I learned yesterday that half of the Republicans in the House of Representatives are not are not vaccinated. That is what correct. the hell are you thinking, folks? I, not. I, the vaccines they're are not. amazing. They work. They're safe. Just get vaccinated and we'll be out of this. But you're screwing around. With and it. actually, yeah. one of the most disappointing things I saw on the news last night uh, was uh, I'm sorry if this is uh, sounds political, but. We have said before that where politics comes up against the science, we're going to discuss it. Kevin McCarthy, with a bunch of uh, yes, sir. Sir. people in the background, That's right. talking about the situation and basically uh, essentially trashing the CDC Correct. for changing their recommendations, just as you mm. uh, uh, were describing um, yep. uh uh, Dixon. Yeah, and to right. me, right. this is sowing distrust no question. in the institutions that we rely on no to question. keep us safe. Okay. No and uh, right. I think that that's frankly irresponsible. Okay. No I think you need to, if you're going to talk about this in public and you're in a position of authority, you need to understand the data. You need to understand the right. uh, pandemic. There can't be any political motivations involved. Uh, and you have to do your very, very best to represent the truth. And I don't think that was happening there. And people are going to come away from that thinking you can't trust the CDC. And I think that's the wrong message. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. And to sort of, this isn't on the sort of the politics side, but it's something that Rich's comment made me really think about is I think a lot of this also goes back to people still not understanding how the process of science works. And the fact that we are constantly Correct. getting new information and sort of altering our conclusions. You know, I, I come across people every day who think that because you're a scientist, you have access to some secret big book of all the answers. Mm-hmm. Um, and in yeah. fact, that's not it. It's about a process. And yeah, so you have, the, you have the methods, you don't have the results. Right. And so <laughs> it only makes sense to trash the CDC if you think it's because they were giving you the wrong information out of that magic book. If you actually think about the fact that, no, they're getting new information, new data and changing their mind and altering what they their conclusions, then you're like, oh, yeah, that's how science is supposed to work. So and Brianne, so this to me just yeah, goes back yeah. to the fact that we need to always when we're answering our questions at town halls or whatever, talk about, well, these are the new observations that were made. And this is what led to, you know, my changing my position. Like, I think that we all, we all need to remember to do that. Even the observations are not clear at this point. I know. No, they're not. Right. Um, Right. I learned this week that India has vaccinated 450 million people. I was on a call with Mumbai, people in Mumbai. Can you, 450 million people. That's nearly half the population, right? It's not half, but it's more than us. And the lady who was talking about this said, we have no problem with vaccines here in India. And I I wish we were the same way. Everybody goes to get The only problem they have is no vaccine. (laughs) Yeah, that's They're short on vaccine right now. We have plenty and we cannot convince. By the way, Rich, Rich, McCarthy attacks democracy. I mean, he's going to, he attacks everything. Of course he does. You know. 
He has no no morals whatsoever. I think the biggest problem here, above all else, and you've used these words again and again, just over the last half hour, the virus evolved. The virus is evolving. The disease is evolving. You use that word evolve, you meant to say evolution. And when you say evolution, you've got half of the people against you. Period. <laughs> they do not want to hear the word evolution. Oh, I don't think they think they of it do, in the same way, Dixon. I don't think they do. <laughs> Well, if they if they hear that word, they they rile against it, and they try to find another reason yeah. for the results. Well, if if and nothing else, whether if they don't, they may not, you know, be on board with all types of evolution, but they probably haven't learned about what evolution really means. Yeah, well, no. that, of course they haven't, because they well, we won't go there either. But um, no, I, I if have you tell slide. me that the vaccine they gave us in March will not work in February of next year, I would believe that. Well, there's no data. Well, a lot of other people said, "Look, I was Dixon, vaccinated." Dixon, don't say that because it's at the moment their their vaccines are working. Okay, I understand that, um, but I would I would be willing to accept that result if that's what had happened. Well, right now that's the data, right? The data are yep. that the vaccines prevent severe disease and death with the variants, with all the variants. Yeah, right. That's those are the data, and if you think otherwise, Dixon, you're listening to the wrong. Um, no, 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 no. I didn't <laughs> say it was. This, this is a hypothetical, Vincent. Okay. Hypothetical. My apologies. Um, the um, evolution I, in my course, I have a slide that I show, and I said in viruses, evolution appears f occurs so quickly that even non-believers get it. <laughs> <laughs> nope. No, I'm no sorry. you don't think so. Okay. I know they don't. I know um, they don't. So, I, I found a couple of articles uh, I wanted to just briefly talk about because I think the people are really uh, interested in these issues. And we got some emails about it, too. Um, as you know, the CDC changed its masking guidelines to uh, recommend yes. that people, even vaccinated, should be wearing masks in, in certain situations. And so this led to people asking, well, why, why are you doing that? And apparently there's some data they're basing it on. And um, today in um, MMWR, just this morning, uh, the, the latest issue, there is an article um, which I think is part of the basis for this. It's a uh, article, Outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 Infections, including vaccine. Daniel and I don't like the word breakthrough. We call it the B word. Vaccine B infections associated with large public gatherings, um, Barnstable County, Massachusetts. So basically, July 2021, following multiple large public events, uh, 469 COVID cases were identified among residents who had traveled to the town. 74% occurred in fully vaccinated persons. So this is via testing. And the uh, Delta variant was identified in 90% of the variant specimens from 133 patients. And then they say, and I think this is the key sentence, cycle threshold values were similar among specimens from patients who were fully vaccinated and those who were not. All right. Huh. And, and um, Daniel mentioned this uh, in yesterday's update as well. And he was kind of skeptical of that because that's, not what we're thinking that is happening with the vaccine. So um, there is an article that Daniel discussed yesterday. It's a New England Journal article, COVID-19 breaks another B in, in vaccinated healthcare workers. <laughs> Among uh, 9, 1,497 fully vaccinated healthcare workers, 2.6%, uh, 39 had infections. 74% uh, of these had a high CT value. Of these patients, only 17, 59% had a positive antigen test. So these people have a, a you know a low a low CT, but a lot of them don't have antigens. So what is going on? And this is what Aunt Daniel was talking about. He said, well, kind of an, maybe they don't really have an infection. There's just RNA there. Maybe you get inf virus comes in your nasopharynx, it doesn't reproduce, maybe because you have antibodies or CTLs. And it's not really a positive. So do you understand what I'm saying? I'm wondering about this same CT value in Delta vaccinated and Delta unvaccinated. Maybe that's not real, right? So well, that's why I say I the science the isn't jury's clear. Out. Jury's out. Jury's okay. out. I agree. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, hoping that we can, matter of fact, I got an email from a uh, listener who I've 
communicated with outside today saying, when are you guys going to do an episode that focuses on the Delta variant? Yeah, we and will. My, my answer is, as soon as we have data. enough data. Yeah, right. <laughs> I would like to have Because I have a data. lot of questions. I would like data, yeah. but so far it's... Uh, I mean, it's preprints, and I really would like them to be peer reviewed and have the extra experiments done if necessary, and then we'll start. I mean, I just saw this week a preprint looking at transmission in a hamster model of the alpha variant. It takes that long for that for the work to be done, right, and to be submitted. So we're not going to uh, see. Yes, Delta. and that's an important point because uh, the public health officials need to respond quicker than that. That's right. Okay. That's right. And so that's one of the reasons that there is this problem mm -hmm. with, you know, Agreed. show me the data. They, they, they see cases going up and, you know, the, uh, I used to report on the uh, situation in uh, Austin where they track uh, the presence of COVID by looking at hospital uh, COVID uh, cases in the hospital. They're not just looking at testing. They're looking at hospitalized COVID, uh, verified COVID cases in the five counties that's the metropolitan statistical area. Yeah. And if you look at the situation now, okay, there is an uptick in cases that's identical kinetically to what happened in both the first and the second big waves that's going up to, frankly, an alarming level. OK, now, I don't think we know all the reasons for that. And I think it's probably really complicated. Are they unvaccinated involving people mostly? Uh, they're mostly, uh, mostly unvaccinated individuals, mm -hmm. OK, as far as I understand it. OK, um, but, um, you know, as first of all, as we've said before, if everybody were vaccinated, this uh, wouldn't be a problem. OK, right. so that's the number one problem. But in terms of in this situation where not everybody is vaccinated, my guess is that the reasons for that are really complicated. OK, having to do with behavior because restrictions have been relaxed. And, you know, yeah, if 40 sure. percent of 40 or 50 percent of the people are unvaccinated, there are many fewer than that wearing masks in places despite CDC recommendations. So there's a lot of unvaccinated people running around without masks. OK, um, and it could be that the variants play into this as well via whatever affects fitness uh, in those. So it's complicated, but the public health officials can't wait around until they understand exactly what it is. They no. see this happening and they have to respond by doing whatever they can that they know historically can impact this. And what can impact it? Vaccination and modification of behavior, including social distancing and masks, okay? And they'd like to do that. If I were a public health official, I'd like to do that and and see if I can get this under control before I have to do something more drastic like tell everybody to stay home again. So quit bitching about masks, dude, okay? Feel lucky that somebody's watching and uh, trying to take care of you. Yeah, I, I will admit that when I read about this last night and they said there's going to be data tomorrow, um, these were not the data I was <laughs> expecting to see. I was these expecting to see something. You were expecting. I was expecting to see something about. <laughs> yes, right, that's right. yes, exactly. <laughs> you um, I, I was expecting something maybe that actually had something to do that actually showed transmission, but at the same time, we're seeing this increase in hospitalization in cases um, that we've seen that looks similar to what we've seen before. The obvious answer to that in terms of how you try to stop that before you have a whole bunch of people in the hospital who are really sick is to have people start masking again, um, which, you know, to me is not a big issue. I'm happy I, to wear I, my look, mask. I agree. I think the vaccination is, has always been on the table, right? Always get vaccinated. I think them CDC saying no more masks in May was a mistake. They should have kept yeah. doing it. Oh, okay. That's fine. But I think they need to just say we're having outbreaks you need to mask and don't blame it on CT values or as as Daniel said last night, don't blame it on the variant. Just tell people to mask up because if it turns out you're wrong, then you have more even more of a problem. Right. Yeah, right. And as it is, people are questioning these data already because they're kind of borderline, as as Brianne said. So I would just say we're having outbreaks. You need to mask up and distance, blah, blah, blah. That's what I would do. But I'm not in charge. So, well, and I think there's one other <laughs> 
piece to this quote that you have um, that we might want to just mention briefly, Mm -hmm. Um, because to me, it's like, oh, of course, this is obvious. But I could see how someone who doesn't think about these types of data would be very confused um, by the sentence that uh, they found these cases among people who had traveled to the town. Um, 346, 74 percent occurred in fully vaccinated persons. Right. And so the fact that the majority of these infections are in fully vaccinated persons, um, I hear people being confused about from time to time lately. And so I could give another sentence. I don't know the exact number, but I will tell you that the majority of um, COVID infections that happened in this group were among people who had two legs. I think about that because my cat is missing a leg. Um, (laughs) So um, and that's because most people have two legs. And so if the, the do- denominator, the majority of people are in one group, then the majority of cases will be in that group. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I'm glad you raised this, uh, Brianne, because uh, I think the uh, limitations part of the discussion for this uh, report are as important as anything else. Uh, and I'm going to so I'm going to uh, highlight that it says first. The data from this report are insufficient to draw conclusions about the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, including the Delta variant, during this outbreak. Um, Second, asymptomatic breakthrough infections might be underrepresented. Third, this is really important. The demographics of cases likely reflect attendees uh, at the public gathering as events uh, were uh, marketed to adult male participants. Um, hmm. and finally, uh, uh, there was another one in here. There was, there was something in here about, um, uh, it's hard to judge the significance of saying that a certain percentage happened amongst vaccinated people because the percentage of people that are vaccinated, this is kind of what you're saying. Yep, exactly. Is, uh, it, it is variable depending on the gathering. Okay. Right. So if everybody was vaccinated and you have some backgrounds of uh, 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 some um, infections, uh, infections, then of course the majority are going to be in people who are vaccinated. Yeah. Doesn't and tell so, you about the general population. Right. And so the, the percentage of infections among vaccinated people I've heard recently bandied around as something that people are worried about. And I think yes. that, that, that piece is not, you know, Take into we, account. As we've I said, think- for polio vaccines, 100% of people who are vaccinated get infected. You just don't get polio. So I don't, <laughs> as long as you don't get severe disease and die, I think right. we're okay. And right. I think this, uh, this statistic is still true, mm. as far as I know, that uh, greater than 95%, even greater than 97% of the people who are in the hospital now are unvaccinated individuals. That's correct. That alone correct. should tell you that something. Correct. Okay? Yeah, that's what Daniel says. Right. That's right. That's why people should get vaccinated. What's stopping you? Less than 40% in Tennessee. Why is it a political the, issue? The Surgeon General came on the air recently and said the biggest deterrent in getting vaccinated right now is the amount of misinformation that's out there. Yeah. And that's a biggest problem what, of tell this me because you what can what kind of misinformation right prevents people from getting vaccinated, for example. Yeah. Give me, give me an uh, example. It's an experimental vaccine. It's got okay. a microchip in it that's it allows Google to follow you around wherever you live. It's not it's a, gene it's therapy. Not a, it's it's, a, gene it's gene not therapy. approved. Keep okay. Going. We're all gonna <laughs> drop dead fifteen years from now. But they put, Okay. It's the millions of people. There's no issues. Vincent, uh, yeah, but uh, we we've been through this before. Those Data, okay, I know. statistics in don't work. <laughs> it's I'm emotional you, stories. It's this anecdotes. really bothers me. Sure. At a, and probably you too, more than anything else, that we have great vaccines and people I won't know. take them. It didn't bother me for flu because it's a much smaller issue. But this bothers me because millions of people are at risk and. This is what happens when you don't get vaccinated. And well, talking about Kieran Thacker, neuropsychological issues. I'm suffering this because you're not getting vaccinated. <laughs> well, well, also, you know, people have been able to see over the past year and a half or almost two years, the effect of this virus on their life. No question. And yet no they still don't want to get vaccinated. Question. If you want it to be over, if you don't want to wear a mask, get vaccinated. The, They'll take uh, care of the it. Do you guys see... Um, Who's the Star Trek guy, uh, Mr. Sulu? Who, what was it? Who's oh, the, George Takai. George Takai. He, he tweeted the, the other day, he said, 
the anti-vaxxers don't realize that they're the control group now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's not a funny thing, though. That's not it funny. It is not That's funny. not funny. But it's their choice, Dixon. I know it is. I know it is. They're choosing not to be vaccinated. That's and- true. All right, that's enough. Okay. Yeah, I, I have one, one other thing I, I, I want to add, because we were talking about how uh, the CDC uh, eased, you know, uh, changed the guidelines to t- uh, tell vaccinated people they uh, didn't need a mask, and that didn't work. Yeah. And um, I think one of the public health lessons from this, and one of the things that mm. has, has changed, one of the lessons from that is that you cannot in this population selectively unmask people. That's right. Okay. Absolutely. They, they thought that would work. They thought you could say, okay, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask and that would be a little reward and blah, blah, blah. No, everybody took off their masks. And I think that that is at least a contributing factor, if not the major contributing factor uh, to uh, yeah. the yeah. Uh, uptick in cases. So now- yeah. Agreed. Uh, everybody's got to wear a mask because that's the only way to get it under control. And frankly, um, if I have to wear a mask, even though I'm vaccinated, in order to help get this under control, fine. It's not a I big don't have deal. A problem. But you know, back in April, we did say here on TWIV that it wasn't a good idea because people who are not vaccinated were going to unmask. We knew right. it would happen. So here you go. It was a worthy experiment. Now we have yeah. a result. I guess it was because we don't have a history of masking here in the U.S. So no. we didn't know, but yes. Well, you know, I guess it's naive, unfortunately, to think that this population uh, would ask, uh, would would um, uh, respond in the greater uh, interest of the population. Okay? Mm. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay. <sighs> Uh, here's the thing. Should we do a couple of emails or should we go to picks? Up to you. Yeah, you're the boss. Let's do a couple of emails, one one each. Okay. Right. Dixon, yeah. can you take that first one? I can. Bistra writes, Dear Twiv team, I live in the U.S., but I am writing you from my beautiful hometown, Varna, in Bulgaria, where my children and I are spending time with my parents while I'm taking advantage of one of the few pandemic perks – Working remotely. Dixon, can you move your mic? It's scraping. Thank you. How's that? Very good. Want me to repeat or no, just no, keep it's going? Good. It's good. Sadly, despite dismal pandemic mortality last winter and a wide availability of all vaccines, Bulgaria has the lowest rate of COVID vaccination in the EU despite that. <laughs> and even more sad is the fact that only 20% of Bulgaria's healthcare workers are vaccinated. I'd like to, I'd like your advice on how to respond to two frequent COVID vaccination objections I hear. One, many worry about either an allergic reaction or cite existing autoimmune disorders as a contraindication to the COVID vaccine, very often through the advice of their GP or general practitioner. Most recently, a friend with lupus on corticosteroids was advised by a rheumatology physician not to get vaccinated because the steroids were protective. Hmm whatever that means. My understanding is that both statements are incorrect, but being a layperson to this field, I naturally have doubts. I would love to hear your perspective and resources I can share for autoimmune disorders concerns. Two, you want to answer that first? Yeah, why don't we? Okay. I don't think there's any connection. I have a That's- little bit of uh, insight into this because, in fact, I have a, a relative who kind of falls into this category, including a, a physician who recommends against their getting vaccinated. It's not an autoimmune uh, uh, situation. Well, there's some respiratory issues that have an asthma background involved. Right. Yeah. Uh, and there's also uh, other issues of uh, mild in- immunosuppression because of a uh, chronic um uh, condition. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've looked at the CDC uh, guidelines in this case, and they say consult with your physician, which I think is appropriate. And I'm not going to give uh, medical advice on this. However, uh, I think the CDC guidelines with respect to respiratory issues and uh, asthma and allergic reactions are that unless you have a documented history of a severe anaphylactic reaction to something that's in one of these vaccines, you should get vaccinated. Okay, that asthma is not a contraindication. Okay, no, not at all. Uh, uh, and likewise, uh, immunosuppression. 
is not a contraindication in anything. If anything, it's an indication. It may be that you won't respond to the vaccine as robustly as you might if you were fully immunocompetent, okay? However, you're going to have a more difficult time with the virus as well. So my understanding is that under both of those circumstances, uh, they are not contraindications and you uh, really need to get vaccinated. If you've got a history of asthma or something like that, the vaccine isn't going to kill you. That's not a contraindication. If anything, it's going to kill you. It's the virus. Hmm. Right. Get vaccinated. Right. Yeah. So steroids are going to be suppressing an immune response. And yeah. so, in fact, they would not be protective. They would be unprotective. Right. Um, and, um, you know, I've heard of some people who have autoimmune disorders who worried about whether they would have additional um, reactogenicity, um, perhaps, but. Um, that's something to talk about with your physician. And that's not necessarily a reason to not get vaccinated because as Rich said, you're going to um, potentially fare quite poorly following this infection. Um, and I would also like to tell all of the people who were watching us on YouTube um, to point to note when uh, that letter was read, how many times I did not throw things because I really thought about it a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> all right. right. Uh, according, hold on. According to the oh. Lupus uh, Foundation, you lupus is not a... A contraindication for COVID vaccination. I'll put a link in since you would like to share a link. There you go. Good. That's good. Okay. Two, many believe prior infection protects them. Antibody count tests are done frequently by anybody despite my observed lack of understanding of the results, meaning and often physicians seem to advise against vaccination until the antibody count goes down. Is there any merit to that claim? How does one convince people who have already had covid to get vaccinated. Thank you for your incredible and wonderful public service, the, the public service that you provide. I am grateful that I discovered your podcast last winter through the amazing Lori Garrett. Hmm. Best uh, kind regards, uh, Bistra. Well, they, so, they do say th- you have to have recovered for so many months be- after COVID before you get vaccinated, right? But in fact, right. if you do get vaccinated after recovering, you get it a great boost and a really broad exactly. response, which we talked about on Twitter. It covers all the variants then. It's really good. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, we have this discussion a lot. You, um, I mean, there there have been some studies where the efficacy of natural infection has been studied in healthcare workers, right? It's, it's not bad. It's, but- it's less than the vaccine, though, because they don't, they have a lot of other antigens going on there, except for the spike. The antigen for the spike is pure protection and nothing else, I well, think. That's, but that's it, what it, I infection gives you, there's a new preprint from B. Nash and Hatsuyano out now, which says infection gives you an amazing breadth of, of antibody responses, um, yeah, yeah. much better than vaccination, apparently. And boosting makes it even better. So Got that's it. a reason to get a, at least one, one boost is all you need after natural infection. There's no reason not to get vaccinated after infection, and it's even better uh, insurance. I don't, I don't get it. Yep. I don't. Bingo. All right. Uh, let me take the next one since it's uh, long and a former student in this department. Maureen writes, thank you for all you do with TWIV. I was fortunate to have been influenced by Vincent's teaching and guidance when I was in grad school. Vincent also graciously gave a talk at SUNY New Paltz, my home institution, about a decade ago. How lucky were we? He is generous, smart, and fun. The TWIV panelists also share these characteristics, and we are also fortunate to have this podcast. I remember Maureen drove me to dinner. She drives a stick shift. All right. We rapping about stick shifts. I had long waited to wanted to teach a virology course, had the opportunity to do so for the first time in spring 2020. What timing? I had started to listen to TWIV more regularly in the fall of 2019, so as to be better prepared for my new class. Then, of course, SARS-CoV-2 began its march across the globe. It was such a challenge to keep up with the literature and other developments, but TWIV helped me decide which research developments to share with my students. My TWIV education also helped when I participated on a panel for a local venue, the Rosendale Theater Collective. In November 2019, our Rosendale Theater Science on Screen Committee chose to organize a panel discussion to follow an in-person April showing of Contagion. What timing? Movie and panel were obviously switched to a virtual format, and the focus was on SARS-CoV-2, not the unnamed virus that starred in the film. My co-panelist and I gave a shout-out to TWIV. 
I've also sound portions of TWIV in my microenvirology classes. I think the most significant of those episodes, those assignments included the episode with Robert Fully Love. Those episodes that diverged from regular virology topics were powerful and important. Fully Love's perspective provided so much more than I could have ever communicated. I hope I'm clearly conveying how grateful I am for TWIV. Early in the pandemic, many friends asked me for a good source of information to learn about SARS-CoV-2 developments and TWIV was my top recommendation. One of my chemistry department colleagues became a devotee. Our bike rides continue to include conversation about what was discussed on TWIV that week. Not everyone is tuning out when you discuss non-COVID topics. Another topic we have discussed is how does Brianne manage to find time for participating in podcasts while also teaching at a primarily undergraduate institution? It's taken me so long just to find the time to write you all. I hope she has a course release. Can you tell my dean that, Maureen? <laughs> <laughs> I've fallen. Is um, New Pulse a PUI, Brianne? I believe it is, yes. I have fallen woefully behind on TWIV episodes as I have not been doing much of my podcast listening activities, mowing the long, long trips in my manual car, <laughs> etc. A recent episode for me answered one of my burning questions that Alan and I overlap at Columbia. I have thought he seemed familiar, but noted that regularly listening to the podcast might cause that sense of familiarity. But it turns out we did overlap. I was part of the Fred Alt Lab Group. Alan must have attended the Halloween or other parties on the sixth floor. For your entertainment, I'm sharing a link to a video made by the drummer in our all-faculty band, Biology, Physics, Sociology, and Psychology. Note that none of us are in the music department. <laughs> we are questionable authorities with a capital Q and A, and that is also the name of our band in the spring 2020 semester as a way to recognize the challenges of moving to remote college experience. Our drummer made a video of us performing Dancing With Myself. That feat was topped last fall by his video of us performing All Star as a way to thank our students for having been diligent about wearing masks. Both were recorded individually and remotely. Of course, the All Star chorus lyrics were changed to, hey now, put your mask on, keep your distance, stay safe, and later updated to, hey now, get your vax on, no resistance, stay safe. That's our title, get your vax on. Hey, now, get your vax on, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. The other altern alternate lyrics, including references to Fauci, begin at just under one minute. Give us a link. If you have some free time and could use it, giggle, check it out. We've been testing out alternate lyrics to hit me with your best shot. Infect me. It's all in vain. I've got antibodies from mRNA. <laughs> Though our best alternate lyric song would be the New Paltz alma mater set to Dead Kennedy's Holiday in Cambodia, which I remember. I remember that song. Vincent, you are welcome to grab your guitar, visit New Paltz again, and jam <laughs> with questionable authorities. Hope some of this made you smile because Twiff has definitely made me smile. With gratitude, Maureen Morrow, who I remember very well. Um, Excellent. It did make me smile. And everyone me else too. too. Me too. And I am also a questionable authority with a Q and capital Q and A. So yeah, I'll bring my guitar <laughs> sometime. That would be cool. Yeah, Maureen was a grad student here with Fred Alt many years ago. And um, now she's up at New Pulse. And I did visit. It was a lot of fun. Fred Alt was a guitar player too. He was. Yep. And his son is uh, Kenji Alt Lopez. Star chef, chef, right? <laughs> Fred is no, a star I scientist. Know that. Oh, I didn't know Fred that. Fred is a star oh. scientist and his son is a star chef. Yeah. You, you should I'm look into familiar. his, I, I've picked some of his cookbooks and some of his articles about cooking before. They're fantastic, Dixon. You should definitely look into it. Wow. Wow, I will. Priyan, can you take the next one? Sure. Charles writes, hello, Twivers. Sunny and 84 Fahrenheit, 29 Celsius, heading to over 90. In other words, a typical summer day in Chapel Hill. Encouraging a layperson to take Dr. Reconiello's virology course can have some unintended consequences, like me asking some strange questions after watching just two lectures. Is the Delta variant more fit because it has a lower particle to PFU ratio? I googled and could not find the answer. I did find some nice papers on lateral flow tests and other interesting subjects. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Great. Sure. Why not? That's a great question. I don't know if we know the answer to that. No, we won't find it yet. It hasn't been done. But Charles, um, last week, wrote an email, which we read, that said, he wrote at the end, I just learned of this new word in silico. I've never heard of it. 
So I sent him a slide from one of my lectures. I said, come on, Charles, it's in lecture number whatever. And then she started taking the course. So good, good for you, Charles. But yes, a, a lower particle PFU could make a virus more fit. Absolutely. You are learning, man. <laughs> uh, oh, Glenna sends a link to a YouTube video, which is pretty cute. <coughs> Should take a look at it. It's, it's one person and she does different things and she puts them all together on the same screen, you know, and she sings yeah. a song. What is the name of the video? I forgot. It's called uh, The Scientist, A Tribute. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the it's woman a is Ellen Burbridge, <laughs> and I, I have not listened to it. I will, but it's a a uh, a musical tribute to scientists. Brian, did you look at this? I did not look at it, but it sounds awesome. I'm going to look at it so, as soon as we're done. It's the same person, and she just records herself in multiple panels, and they're all like they're talking to each other as if they were different persons, and then they all sing and play guitar together. It's really good. But it's a tribute to scientists. It's, that's the good part about it, yeah. Um, and finally, Rich, can you take that last one? Jody writes, hello, Vincent and Twiv gang. I'm writing from Oakland, California, where it's been mostly cool this summer in the low to mid-60s with some overcast days mixed in with some very lovely sunny days. Overall, not a hot summer for us. It was 74 F23C and sunny today, and I believe it will be as warm tomorrow. I've been enjoying your podcast since stumbling upon it during a pandemic in May 2020. I can't listen to every single show, but I try to tune in at least once a week. You all have kept me sane during uh, one of the strangest times in my 47 years. Also, I've never thought I would have an interest in microbiology or learning about viruses. I've always been more drawn to social sciences and the arts. Well, you've definitely gotten me interested in virology. Keep up the good work. I'm writing because I would love to hear your thoughts about CDC recent interim public health recommendations for fully vaccinated people. I'm curious about this because I was recently infected with SARS-CoV-2 and tested positive for COVID while I was visiting family and friends in New York City. I suspected that it was a bar or restaurant, but I'll never know for sure. By the way, I am fully vaccinated, having received my second Pfizer jab back in mid-March. My symptoms were very Mild, I did lose my sense of smell for about two weeks. My sense did thankfully uh, come back today. To me, that means that the vaccine works wonderfully. Let me see, this uh, sounds like um, she uh, was infected post-vaccination, mm -hmm. right? She That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm curious about is the fact that no one who was around me got sick. My girlfriend, her brother, and his roommate, for whom, uh, for whom we were all staying uh, in their tiny and stuffy two-bedroom uh, bed-sty apartment, N uh, none of the friends who we visited got sick either. All of them are vaccinated, and all of them did get tested after hearing of my positive test. They all tested negative. Uh, FYI, I was likely infected on Monday or Tuesday. I didn't get symptoms until Thursday. I thought it was allergies for several days due to the fact uh, that we were staying at home with a cat. I do have mild cat allergies. I wasn't able to get tested until the following Monday after I arrived home for a few days. Testing in the San Francisco Bay Area is lacking these days. I'd love to know how much virus a fully vaccinated person uh, really does shed. So would we? <laughs> That's the data I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, are there any data yet on the Delta variant and how it affects vaccinated persons? Uh, are they really all that contagious? We don't know, as far as I know. According to their CDC's recent guidelines, it seems that vaccinated people are contagious and should not be in contact with anyone for 14 days. From my own personal experience, it seems as if I barely shed any virus at all. Could that be true? Also, uh, are the data are data available yet on how long a vaccinated person is contagious? Uh, the 10 day quarantine period, the quarantine period seems just too long. Although I did quarantine indoors once uh, I realized I had COVID. I never did self-isolate from my girlfriend and she never got any symptoms uh, or test positive. What's the deal? Thank you so much. I hope you all have a great week or weekend, depending on when you read this, Jody. What a great letter. Okay, so I'll have a crack at this first. Um, 
I think the summary here is we have a person who uh, was vaccinated, uh, subsequently got infected, uh, not clear how, uh, during this time was exposed to lots of different people, all of whom remain, uh, remain negative, uh, and most of whom, if not all of whom, were vaccinated as well. I think uh, that's uh, a mm, uh, not an uncommon anecdote that we're hearing. I would still say it globally or population-wise, this sort of reinfection thing, if you like, uh, or infection of a vaccinated individual is a relatively rare event, but we're hearing more and more about it. Don't know why. Is immunity waning? Does the Delta variant have anything uh, to do with it? Uh, are there simply more vaccinated people? So we're uh, uh, seeing a greater population that this could happen. Don't know the answers to that. Uh, to me, your situation is good news. Okay, you didn't get very sick. None of your buddies got sick. That's all good stuff. Okay, and beyond that, we have all the same questions that you do. And I don't have the answers. Yeah, that's right. They didn't say when the others had been vaccinated either. No. Because they could have been vaccinated two or three months prior to that, and they would be fully immune, so that's why they didn't get infected. Maybe. So I've been, uh, I've been saving this for uh, Vince's pick later on, but I'm going to uh, jump the gun and say that I saw Paul Offit on TV the other night, and I, I thought he had a so great... Not. I thought he had a great analogy for vaccination, which is it's like the fire extinguisher in your kitchen. That's right. Okay? That's right. Uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily keep you from having a fire, Okay. Right, right, right. But when you do have a fire, you can put it out. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what your immune system is. It's a fire extinguisher I in your like kitchen. That. Yeah, great. It's it's true. Very good. Paul's a smart guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and he's a pistol too, man. He was going 100 miles an hour on this interview. He was awesome. Um, yeah, I think this is the right experience here. I think as you get farther out from vaccination, you're going to get infected, but it's going to be mild and maybe you're not going to transmit. Right. Because the memory is going to clamp down. Fire extinguisher. Okay, that's good. Thank you for reading those. We got more, but we'll get to them next time. Let's do some picks. Yep. <clears throat> Dixon, what do you have for us? Well, I have had uh, some time on my hands here since I'm recuperating uh, from back surgery, as most of you know. And if you don't know it, that's okay. Um, no harm, no foul. So... There, I haven't been in any pain or anything, but I've been uh, mobile challenged, let's just put it that way. So I've been watching the Olympics, and the Olympics has had a remarkable occurrence, which I want to point out, not because of who they are, but because of the mindset of both of these people. Simone Biles and uh, Suni Lee uh, have one thing in common. We have several things in common. The thing, the thing they have in common is that they both won the gold medal in the Olympics for best all-around gymnast. But they ran, they won them in different years, of course. <laughs> Simone ran hers uh, last year, and Suni won hers this year. The reason why Suni won it, we think, is because Simone Biles, in one of her uh, exercises, uh, actually during the competition got halfway up in the air and forgot what to do. That is not the time you should forget what to do. Because you could land on your head, for instance, and break your neck or die. Um, she got up to the event on the vault, hit the vault, did a double somersault, and then didn't know what to do next. What did she do? She fall? She, she faltered, but she didn't fall. She stumbled. I see. And... When she did, she went right over to her coach and she says, I quit. I cannot do this anymore hmm. because I have not got the right mental frame of mind to carry out my assignment. She's been inundated with requests from various places, of course, from the press, from doing ads on television, uh, being the best that ever was. There are five moves in gymnastics named after her that nobody else can do. Hmm. But the woman who picked up the slack, Suni Lee, said, well, I don't, I'm not in that mindset bubble. I will pick up where she left off, and I will pick up the slack. That's what kind of a team this is. And she won the gold medal this year. And I think that is remarkable. Simone Biles stayed on. She rooted her, her teammates on. Uh, 
Hmm. She didn't leave. She didn't walk off in a huff and quit or anything like this. She just said, I'm flummoxed. I had brain fog. I got up to the top of my leap and I couldn't, I didn't know what to do next. That's not where you should be. And we still don't understand that, of course. But there was another uh, woman who also plays tennis. Uh, not also plays tennis, but she plays tennis. Osaka. Uh, and she is Japanese by birth, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And she's playing in Japan. And she played in the Olympics. And she came. She was eliminated. Because she, she lost her ability to concentrate. We don't know what that really means. Except that these people are willing to say this. Rather than to try to go on and fail. And I think that's the beauty of sports and the beauty of people who have a lot of self-confidence. And I'm, I'm deeply um, in admiration of these two people for different reasons. Simone Biles for what she did and Suni Lee for what she did. And they both rose to the occasion in their own way. And they both made important statements about what it means to be an elite athlete. And uh, I think it's worth noting that because the Olympics are still in progress. But this, this applies to everything. This applies to be a, you know the the best virologist in the world, or the best uh, tennis player, or the best uh, chess player. These people reach blocks in their lives which they have to say, I, I can't I can't do this anymore until I figure out what's wrong. Mm. You know, um, and I think every one of us has encountered some problem like that in our own lives. And these people, their lives are larger than life, basically, because they're in the spotlight all the time. And I'm, I'm in deep admiration for them. So I, I picked them as my pick of the week. Dixon, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's important that we say that, you know, this isn't just happen to the best virologist. It happens oh, to no, 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 anybody. No, 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 no. And it's great. Right. It's really inspiring to have someone That's say, right. I'm not okay, and I'm exactly. going to take a minute. Hey, exactly, but exactly, exactly. Dixon, I, I, no, no, I, I totally agree. I, I like you your are. picks, but I really enjoyed how you described them also. It was good. good. You're, uh, you have a you. way with words, Dixon. I, I oh, have to. that's nice of you to say that. But I was, I was in tears when I learned of Simone Biles' reasons for dropping out. You mm. know, at first I was stunned. And then I, of course, I saw her in, in several of her uh, preliminary events, and she came away with a perplexed look on her face, like, "That's not me." Mm. You know, she looked at everybody. What, what was I doing there? Uh, does anybody have an explanation? And then, of course, she figured it out. Mm. And to see someone of that quality humble herself in public and still remain herself is remarkable. Quite remarkable. Well, from what I saw, it wasn't even necessarily humbling herself in public. She was just, she was very straightforward about it. She says, you know, I mentally, I I've, can't do this right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, quite another one with, I, with real confidence. One okay, other saying, one, Rich, that is. I saw do that was in the, um, the Australian Open. Uh, was it the Australian? No, it was in Wimbledon when uh, Federer uh, lost in the semis. And he walked off and he says, I'm 39 years old and I'm wondering how much more tennis I have left in me. <laughs> and as a result, he said, I can't compete in the uh, Tokyo Olympics. I'm just not fit, fit for it. And it's possible that I, I'm at the end of my career. To see uh, people I have to say, say that. I have to say that uh, of all the Olympics events, uh, gymnastics for me is the scariest that's correct. I, I have a hard time watching, I, especially I the balance beam. Oh, how about uh, this? Just, oh, God. To imagine falling on that on your head. I know. I just. Yeah. Well, the uneven parallel bars are not so <laughs> tame either. You know, you miss one of those. Yeah. I saw a woman, one of them did a flop flat down on the mats twice. I saw that mm -hmm. one too. That's, oh, she didn't have a bloody nose and she didn't. She just got right back up and did it again. Yeah, they probably do that all the time. That's incredible. You lose your grant, you apply again, God damn it. Doesn't mean you're going to get it, though. <laughs> Dixon, uh, I can't tell you how many times I forget the next question I mean to ask. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I saw an Instagram this week where someone was saying that you know, people are complaining that Simone Biles doesn't show any toughness by doing this. And she said, give kidding. me a break. You guys you can't even kidding. handle a face mask in Wegmans. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. True. Graham, what do you have You're for afraid us? of needles. <laughs> That's right. So I also have been spending a fair amount of time watching the Olympics. 
Yeah. Um, and I found this really cool interactive uh, from the New York Times called How Speed and Distance Dictate the Way Olympians Run. Oh, cool. Um, and they basically studied uh, details of the running stride and running patterns of three different Olympians to look at details of what running looks like when you're doing a sprint versus doing a marathon. Um and it, it's just all sorts of really cool images and descriptions of kind of the science of what's going on, you know, how much time you're in the air versus on the ground. Just cool stuff. Very nice. cool. Nice. nice. Last time you had a swimming uh, thingy, right? The physics I, of swimming. I did. Last time yeah. I had a swimming thing. Very cool. So it's slow and fast twitch muscle. That's it, isn't it? <laughs> Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I have an episode relevant pick. Mm -hmm. Uh called uh, it's a washington post uh, article called cdc this is from a couple of days ago cdc reversal on indoor masking prompts experts to ask where's the data actually that's mm. uh it's where are the data mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right um, <laughs> but i mean that's uh, uh, basically i i want to be careful here because um uh that that headline is a it got me. Okay. So it did its job. Mm. We should note that we all understand that headline writers uh, are independent of the authors of the article. The headline can be taken a couple of different ways. And what I don't want people to come away with is the idea that uh, CDC is uh, acting on no data and just out there winging it. Okay. Which is one of the implications of a, a title like that. But uh, the point is that I have, uh, in the face of all this, been wondering myself intellectually, what is actually fueling this new increase? Okay. Uh, is it, I mean, clearly vaccination is a problem. Okay. That's number one. We all, we can't emphasize that enough, but in the face of the vaccination profile that we're looking at, uh, is it behavior? Is it virus? Is it something else? Okay. Uh, and uh, this caught my attention because as I read it, I realized that I was not alone, that there are a lot of scientists uh, who are looking at a little bit of data and not agreeing on what it uh, means. And, uh, confused and so stay tuned and i hope that down the road um we'll be able to uh, figure some of this out in the meantime as i said before i think the public health officials are responding with uh the tools that they know work best even in the absence of clear uh uh answers about exactly why this is going on so this brings up the bigger question of wh whether you know, public health decisions need to be justified by providing the data to the public, right? I don't think in the old days, which maybe would be pre-internet, let's say, CDC would make a decision. They wouldn't give the data out. We want it because we are data-driven, right? But now I think we're in a different situation where people say, oh, the CDC said this. We want to know why they're saying it. So right. maybe they have to also adapt, adopt to that as well. They're saying, we're doing this because of this. I think it would help. I think, as you said, they did an experiment and it didn't work. And they need to say, we did an experiment and it didn't work. I think that would help a lot. Right? Yeah, and I think that there's, I don't know, but I think that there's a certain amount of this. It's just res responding empirically to a situation, uh, a public health uh, crisis. We we know that masking and, dis uh, and distancing uh, can uh, help control an outbreak. And so even in the absence of uh, uh, understanding completely why this is going on, aside from the fact that there are not enough people back vaccinated, yeah, um, you know, uh, these are the best tools that we have to deal with it. Well, so we, mask we, up. You know, we didn't have vaccines last year, so we masked. And so yeah. it's back to the same thing over and over again. Yeah. We should be masking. Um, mm. But Daniel thinks this latest spike was driven by the 4th of July. Um People Could hanging right. out. I just Could be know. right. Well, uh, I have to say that on my trip back from Oregon, driving through half a dozen states, uh, where you know the average is at least forty percent unvaccinated, mm -hmm. uh, and being out uh, about in public, there was probably fewer than 5% of people wearing masks. Mm, so as sure. I said before, there's a lot of unvaccinated, unmasked people out there. So, so uh, Dixon and Fort Lee, are people masked? 
Yeah, they are. As a matter of fact, they are because we're 60% Korean, first of all. Ah, so they yes. would be masked anyway. Right. I mean, they're used to wearing masks even in no pandemics. They, they just wear them. So they're not offended by that at all. When you go to Costco, 99% are masked because you're not allowed in otherwise. Yeah. <clears throat> How about in Madison, Brianne? Um, the masks uh, tailed off quite a bit. Um, uh -huh. There was an announcement that our county had the highest vaccination percentage in New Jersey. Um, and uh, the masks <laughs> kind of all went away after that. They've started to come back a bit, um, but still not as many as we used to have. How about classes? Are they obliged to mask up? Um, we don't have, don't have classes going on right now. I, I know, but in the fall. Um, right now in the fall, uh, the students uh, need to be vaccinated. Um, they are have not said anything about masks, um, but I don't okay. know whether yesterday's uh, or this recent CDC decision will make any changes. So you're actually going to have a vaccine requirement? We Yes, we do. Yeah, we, we do. So that, Everybody at Columbia has to be vaccinated. You can't get in the building. Is, and that's right. They are going to lift masking in August, but I think they're going to reconsider. They should, because I'm not sure that uh, they should be lifting so, them. Now, I, I mask all the time. I started taking the train now a couple of weeks good. ago. So New Jersey Transit requires masks. The subway requires right. masks. and. Right. Pretty much everyone is masked. It's it's really good. The other day yeah. I was on the train. There's always one person without a mask. And once there were two two women and the guy, the women woman conductor said, "You got to get off the train." And they said, "Where do we get a mask?" He said, "I don't know. Get off the train." <laughs> and then a guy ah. two rows up gave them disposable masks. Wasn't that nice? Oh, yeah. well, that's nice. Then, that's very nice. Then yesterday. There's another guy without a mask, and the conductor said, you need to wear a mask. So the guy took his shirt. He had two shirts on, and he wrapped it around his head. He said, okay, that, that works. And the conductor said, you got to watch out for those variants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Um, so most people are masks on the streets, too, here yes. in the city. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Anyway, my pick is uh, a book from our friends in uh, Mexico. Uh, they have been give, um, publishing a series of children's illustrated books. Uh, the first was Paul has uh, measles, then Paul stays home for uh, COVID. And now we have Paul and the mosquitoes uh, about uh, Paul and his friends are at camp and they're saying, what's the most dangerous animal of, uh, of all? And they decide it's a right. mosquito. And right. this is all about right. mosquitoes and the uh, dangerous diseases that they can spread. Uh, it's written by Susana Lopez, Selene Zarate, Martha Yoko Picho, and illustrated by Eva Lobaton. It's free download. We'll give you the link. That's really cool that they keep doing this. Yeah, it's great. This is awesome. Sounds like a rock group's name also. Paul and the Mosquitoes, yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, and by the way, rock group, I have to, there's a chapter in our, uh, a section in our textbook. Brianne would appreciate that. It's called C1Q in the Collectins. <laughs> and I always thought that would be a great name for a oh. rock band, right? It's in the compliment section, right? C1Q. Yeah, I, I feel like there must be some immunology rock band. But <laughs> C1Q <laughs> in the Collectins. Well, you know, the uh, at ASV a number of years ago, a band played of virologists, and their name is Herpetic Legion. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, actually, there's one called Anthrax also. I was Anthrax is another one. There's one dangy. But Perpetic Legion, I actually videotaped it, and, and it's up on YouTube. Legion. It's up on YouTube. Yeah, Lord. it includes a, a couple of herpes virologists. Does Peppers uh, play bass in that? Uh, I don't no, think so. No, he didn't play bass. No. It was like John Parker so, was one of them and a couple of other people. Then there was a lady playing flute, and I said, are you a virologist? She said, no, I'm neuro. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, you want to? I'll put a link to that. That's pretty cool. And finally, we have a listener pick from Lynn. Here's a reader pick L article from the Atlantic that uses a clever and interesting metaphor: castle defense, to explain SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccine breakthrough. Whole family listens to TWIV every week. Amazing source of information on the pandemic and viruses. Everyone chimes in together when Vincent intones the kind that make you sick, <laughs> as well as entertainment. We were about to listen to the show 
after Alessandro Settes, and my nine-year-old grandson asked, what epitope are we on? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? That's, that's, that's awesome. Brilliant. Epitope 788. <laughs> so impressed and inspired by the hard work and effort that go into each show. Thanks so much for keeping me informed as well as sane since March 2020. I have not missed one TWIV podcast in all that time and plan to keep listening for as long as Vincent keeps podcasting. Best wishes from Western Massachusetts, way more West than Alan. Lynn, just a retired molecular biologist. And Lynn provides a link to this article, Anatomy of Which the is Vaccine quite good. Break, Breakthrough. Yes, it is. That is Epitope 788, folks. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv. Send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. I love your emails. They're so engaged. It's amazing. And it's amazing that you write to a virology podcast and have great things to say. I love it. And if you really love what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Seems like you're feeling chipper these days, right? I feel great. But you're not feeling... Go what's, ahead. What's the name of that town in South Dakota? See, I forgot. I have had a... No, Fargo. 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 You're not Fargo. You're not feeling Fargo chipper. I'm not feeling oh. that kind of chipper. That's no. exactly right. See, that's the last thing movie. you feel like. You guys Matt. get movie references. You know, that's really good. Uh, that's, you know... Yeah. Is that your accomplice in the chipper? That's room? right. You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> betcha. <laughs> Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Condit, Meredith Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>